Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Tefenji, and I'm the Associate Director of the Bray Center for Water Resources Management here at McGill. Um, along with Professor Jin Chia Lu, uh, who is the BRACE Director, and Professor Subhas Koshal, who is the TICED Director, I'd like to welcome everyone watching to today's seminar titled Environmental and Health Impacts of COVID-19 Related Plastic Waste. This is an event co-hosted by BRACE and TICED. So before we begin, on behalf of TICED and BRACE, I would like to acknowledge that McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. And while we look forward to the day when we can host these seminars in person, we are once more meeting in a virtual setting as navigating the pandemic is still part of our daily lives. And it's pretty clear at this point that even once the pandemic is over, its impacts on our societies are likely to last for years. So one of the potential longer lasting impacts is the role of single use plastics in our society, as the use of personal protective equipment has played an important role in preventing the transmission of COVID-19. Now, as we come out on the other side of this pandemic, it is imperative that we do not undermine recent progress made in the sustainable use of plastics. And this is what our seminar will touch on today. So a quick housekeeping note before we start. After the presentations, we will have some time to answer questions uh, from the viewers. So please feel free to enter them in the chat throughout the, the seminar, or you can wait until the end when we'll give you a chance to unmute your mic and ask your question directly if you'd like. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. We are pleased to welcome Professor Tony Walker, who is an associate professor at the School for Resource and Environmental Studies at Dalhousie University. Tony has studied impacts of plastic pollution for nearly 30 years. He was invited by the Deputy Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada to participate in a Leaders and Experts Roundtable on Plastics and Marine Litter to help develop the Ocean Plastics Charter for Canada's 2018 G7 Presidency. And he represented Canada at the G7 Science Meeting on Plastic Pollution in Paris, France. He has authored several publications, including high impact papers describing policies to reduce plastic pollution. We are pleased that he could join us today. Thank you, Tony, for accepting our invitation. And um, it's all yours now. Thank you uh, very much, Natalie. And I'll, um, I'll uh, dive straight in. Um, so welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on uh, your time zone, uh, wherever you are. And uh, as uh, I, I would like to thank Natalie and the team for inviting me to, uh, 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 to participate and present uh, as part of this BRACE uh, uh, webinar series. And um, as uh, Natalie's already mentioned, the, uh, the, 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 the basis of the presentation today is uh, uh, to, to take a, a look, a hard look at the environmental and health impacts of COVID-19 related uh, plastic waste. And, um, what uh, you know? What I, I'm going to focus on, really, uh, before we dive straight into um, uh, to the, uh, the the plastic pollution problem as it relates to COVID-19, um, is to really uh, take a look at how we got here because COVID's been around now for what is it, 18, uh, 18 months, two years, depending on your jurisdiction or how uh, badly uh, affected uh, your jurisdiction is. Uh, but we've always had a uh, a plastic pollution or plastic waste problem. And uh, we're going to take a little uh, bit of a dive into um, to that uh, situation first. Um, title slide. Uh, we know we're talking about COVID uh, related plastic waste uh, in society. And uh, unless you've been living under a rock for the last two years, where everybody's aware of this, there's a huge increased awareness because we've been living uh, uh, through the pandemic. And as we look to come out the other end, um, we really do need to um, think about solutions as we move forward and look at those uh, impacts that we might have left uh, future generations as part of this legacy. But again, how did we get here? Um, we've always had a, um, a, a plastic waste uh, management issue and a plastic pollution issue. And just a little bit, um, 
about my background. Um, I have been working uh, on plastic pollution for some time now. This is an image of myself and a colleague uh, taken at South Georgia, which is in the subantarctic uh, islands in the early to mid 1990s. And my first introduction uh, to plastic pollution and the impacts on wildlife and the environment was uh, uh, as I was working as a zoological field assistant on Antarctic fur seals and other seal species, we uh, noted and observed uh, hundreds of uh, entangled seals uh, per season uh, on a tiny little island that was only a couple of kilometers long and one kilometer wide. And so the main source of that pollution in the early 1990s was mostly related to the fishing industry um, in that region. But what it did, it really um, sparked a research interest uh, a, a solutions-based research interest in uh, the impacts of plastic pollution. And whilst that's uh, 30 years ago, probably even before the, the term microplastics was, was first coined, um, most of the um, research um, emphasis was on large macro debris, the sort of debris that you see stranded on uh, shorelines. So how did we get here? Um, the last slide uh, showed you some impacts of uh, fishing related debris. But since the end of the Second World War, uh, although plastics and, and plastic polymers have been, been around for about a, a century now, they really um, came, became uh, mass produced shortly after the Second World War. And as you can see, this, uh, this is a fairly um, older plot uh, from the Helen MacArthur Foundation. But uh, even prior to, well, I was born in 68. So in 64, there was 15 million metric tons produced globally um, in that year. Uh, and if you look to 2014, yes, it's a bit dated about seven years ago, um, annual production of uh, plastics uh, was uh, around 311 million metric tons. And if we take a look at um, more recent data, um, we have in 2019, um, that figure was now 368 uh, million metric tons. And that uh, report was from last year from Plastics Europe. So it's increased 20 fold uh, in the last 70, uh, 50, 60, 70 years. And so a lot of that uh, plastic waste is largely, although um, uh, many of plastic products in, in cars and uh, in infrastructure in buildings, uh, cladding on the side of houses may have uh, a life expectancy of, of uh, several decades, up to 30 years. Um, the global impacts of plastic pollution to date has largely been born out of uh, mass consumption of single use uh, plastic products. And um, since uh, mass production of plastics began, we've produced as a, as a planet 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic and three, over three quarters of that is already um, waste. So it's either, if we're lucky, it's either in uh, landfills and contained or in uh, 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 more extreme uh, situations, we now have um, mismanaged plastic waste, which is entering the environment. And that's been documented even since I was doing that 30 years ago and as early as uh, the 1950s. So plastics is leaking into the environment. And for many years, it was uh, often thought that uh, the marine or aquatic environments was the primary sink uh, for plastic pollution. And well, we now know that that's not all, uh, always the case. Plastic is pervasive and it, it uh, is entered every single environmental compartment on the planet. And so uh, many of you would have seen images like this before. Um, plastic pollution, especially the macro plastic pollution, isn't just a, um, an aesthetic uh, impact on the environment. Here you can see um, a, a lesion albatross chick that never actually managed to fledge. This is in the Pacific Islands. And uh, over the course um, of, of, a, of several months since it hatched, the parents was bringing back food and that food uh, along with the plastic debris that the parents was uh, downloading food to the chick um, was retained in the stomach. So whilst they, this particular chick didn't die of um, toxins related to the plastics, uh, the, the, the contaminants in plastics or the um, additives in plastics or the to uh, toxic contaminants 
attached to the plastics, it actually uh, starved to death because uh, there was no room for food in its stomach. So yeah, you would have seen images like this, which raises public awareness. And uh, public awareness was very high prior to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you cast your mind back uh, to uh, a few years before the pandemic, this image went viral. This was a YouTube video of a marine biologist removing a plastic straw uh, from the nose of a sea turtle. And shortly after this went viral, there was a lot of uh, public outcry and it again increased awareness on the uh, impacts of plastic straws. And while straws only occupy a, a fraction of the, uh, the global mass or volume of plastic waste, what it did was trigger uh, movements, either an individual action to refuse straws or carry your own uh, stainless steel straw, or um, uh, retailers to, uh, to stop giving them out um, unless specifically asked for, for perhaps medical reasons. So plastic pollution um, is a problem. We know it's impacting wildlife. We know it has impacted wildlife. And here you can see, it, again, it's not just the um, impacts on wildlife or the aesthetic uh, impacts. We now know from, um, from studies looking at uh, ecosystem services, and also loss of um, uh, losses to the economy in terms of loss to tourism, um, damage to infrastructure, uh, blocked um, uh, drains and uh, water uh, systems in many countries. This is an image uh, from Southeast Asia, um, a small child playing um, in, by the beach in a small uh, port. And one of the most recent estimates of global annual impacts, the cost, the economic cost of plastic pollution is estimated at two and a half trillion US dollars uh, per year. Um, Nicola Beaumont's paper in 2019 published in Marine Pollution Bulletin looked at uh, not just the cleanup costs, not just the um, cost to remove this and dispose of it, but also the um, economic losses due to opportunity cost through uh, reduced tourism, reduced fishing revenues and damage to ecosystems. Essentially, that's the, the full cost of the full life cycle of plastics. And, and I would um, wager that that's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, why have we become aware of the perils or the impacts of single use plastics? And again, this is prior to COVID-19, uh, the pandemic that we're still currently uh, living through. Um, these were uh, campaigns led by some celebrities in the UK on the far right, uh, Hugh and Anita. For those of us in North America watching this webinar today, um, you might not know them, uh, but you know there are similar uh, celebrities and you certainly, everyone in, uh, around the planet will uh, know the gentleman on the right, Sir, Sir David Attenborough. And uh, in the last BBC uh, wildlife documentary series, Is everything okay? So yeah, in the uh, the blue uh, the, the the blue planet effect was a documentary and followed up shortly after by the blue planet two, and it was well known as the blue planet effect because there were although there was only a limited amount of footage of the impacts of plastic pollution on wildlife, um, the narration uh, by Sir David Attenborough and uh, uh, the excellent uh, cinema photography really really reached a wider audience, not just researchers, not just academics, not just policymakers, and people started to realize that there were uh, negative impacts of plastic pollution. And, um, and just a, a little recap for uh, people who don't necessarily work in this field, Natalie will probably be cringing now because I'm not really talking about specific size categories of plastics or nanoplastics, uh, but that's beyond the scope of uh, today's webinar. But uh, most of us are aware of the large plastics. Um, I, would, I would say macro plastics, but there's another category called mesoplastics and I don't want to put people to sleep on a, a Wednesday lunchtime. Um, and you all recognize that, uh, the plastic bottles, the plastic uh, bottle caps, plastic bags. And then there's a, a, a term which is uh, widely used now by um, uh, many in the, in the media and researchers is microplastics. So they're particles, plastic particles, less than five millimeters um, in dimension uh, or diameter. Um, and so they're, 
they're sub uh, uh, categorized into secondary microplastics, which are those that are broken down from the larger macroplastics, um, degraded by such things as UV light, time, uh, and, and weathering and wave action. Um, and as the polymers break down, they uh, uh, turn into these degraded secondary microplastics. And then there's another category, uh, the image in the, uh, the, the bottom center, um, primary microplastics are intentionally manufactured and they're uh, called microbeads. And they've been used and still currently used in some jurisdictions as exfoliants in uh, facial scrubs and in some medical applications and some uh, applications for automotive paints and, and, and uh, other medical purposes. But in some jurisdictions, including Canada, uh, microbeads have since been banned um, and, and they've been banned in Europe and, and also in, in the United States. Um, the other or, or uh, another type of uh, uh, microplastic, which is uh, many people may not be aware of, but I think we're increasingly becoming aware is the microfibers from polyester garments. And um, I don't have the moral high ground today. I put on this shirt and looked at the label and uh, I'm 40% disingenuous because this shirt I'm wearing is 40% uh, percent polyester and si only 60% cotton. Um, so you really do have to try very hard to, uh, to find clothing that doesn't contain polyester, uh, myself included. And uh, again, Natalie mentioned uh, in the intro that there've been some excellent um, international, national, and even regional uh, commitments uh, and strategies to actually reduce plastic pollution. Um, uh, Canada, uh, when they held the presidency of the G7 in 2018, made announcements for uh, zero plastic waste and uh, still moving towards that. We've now listed uh, federally six types of single use plastics that will be banned uh, or eliminated from use uh, by the end of this year. And in fact, several provinces in uh, Canada, uh, the first being Prince Edward Island uh, in 2019, uh, banned and eliminated single use plastic bags uh, from their, um, well, from use uh, by the general public. And that was before the pandemic. And we'll see later uh, that those, um, strategies and policies that were poised for being implemented or were just implemented were reversed. So this is just a snapshot of uh, some of the strategies, both internationally um, and, uh, and, and regionally that have been successful, at least uh, moving towards changing behavior. And so these are uh, a little laundry list. Most recently, we've had the amendments to the Basel Convention in terms of exporting plastic waste to uh, third world countries or low income countries in South, particularly in Southeast Asia, but Turkey is included in that, um, is one uh, fantastic uh, move in the right direction. Um, Market-based instruments such as uh, taxes and charges on the use of single use plastics, they've been widely adopted, certainly prior to uh, the pandemic and things like extended producer responsibility where uh, corporations themselves uh, bear the, the cost or the brunt of, uh, of some of these initiatives. And so you can see the G20, the G7, uh, there's various actions listed there. And as I mentioned, uh, Canada has or will be adopting a zero plastic waste. We still have a long way to go, um, but that uh, is the government's commitment here in Canada. And there've been many, um, regional movements and even corporations uh, moving towards uh, eliminating plastic bags. It seems to be a, a low hanging fruit that many jurisdictions around the world have moved to eliminate. Um, and many jurisdictions have, have moved to eliminate and ban uh, those microbeads that I mentioned earlier on. Um, but uh, this movement really only began in the early 2000s uh, and, and increased prior to the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic interrupted many of that uh, or much of that progress. Um, and it's not just governments that legislate uh, to reduce single use plastics. Um, many small organizations, uh, food and retail uh, companies have taken their own initiatives to eliminate uh, single-use plastic cutlery or cups um, and also individual action from uh, individual consumers plays a big part in this. Um, in fact, no, um, I guess, 
no initiative or strategy is too small. It's all a big collective. And so uh, don't wait around. And, and many organizations and individuals have, have not waited uh, for governments to enact a ban. They've taken it up upon themselves to uh, reduce their use of single use plastics. And again, all this is prior to the pandemic. And so there were great um, uh, progress has made and then the pandemic kicked in. So what did this do? Well, um, for a start, um, it triggered the uh, widespread use of uh, uh, non-medical and medical mask wearing and personal protective equipment. So the mask, the gloves, the disinfectant wipes, we're all aware of that and we were, we were quickly brought on board and made aware of that uh, early on in the spring last year, last March here in Canada. Um, it hit Europe uh, uh, several months prior to that and uh, it certainly uh, hit uh, China uh, before that indeed. And so once the pandemic kicked in, um, socializing uh, and, and going to restaurants was also um, reduced. Many uh, restaurants had to close down because of uh, local government health mandates. And uh, because of that, it really increased. Um, there was a dramatic spike in takeaway food and online ordering of food. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, plastic bags used and even the grocery stores and jurisdictions that had previously banned or eliminated single use plastic bags reversed or switched their policies. I mean, we can all remember when we went on to online shopping and curbside pickup, um, even stores uh, like Loblaws uh, or Sobeys that are um, uh, making strides to reduce their use of single use plastic bags in many jurisdictions across Canada. We're now coming out to the back of your car with groceries in single use plastic bags. So it's really difficult to avoid. And um, there was a dramatic uh, rise in that. So. We started to see this. Everybody on this uh, webinar today would have anecdotal uh, stories to tell about how they suddenly started seeing um, indiscriminate uh, disposal and uh, uh, use of masks. And where were we finding them? Pretty much everywhere. Um, and this is an early example um, uh, from uh, Gary Stokes, who uh, works with uh, Oceans Asia. And these are masks just found along a short uh, coastline on a remote beach, uh, just uh, uh, very close to Hong Kong. And so a lot of these images went viral and, uh, you know, lots of uh, news and media picked up on this story. And uh, myself and uh, colleagues in Europe, uh, in, in Portugal and Spain, We'd been working together before uh, on solutions to reduce single use plastics. And uh, we came up with the idea of uh, writing a short perspective article to document uh, the sudden rise in uh, single use plastic pollution. And remember, we were already um, in a situation where single use plastic pollution was a really big global issue, but it was further exacerbated by the pandemic. And so, um, this is, this is not an empirical study. This is a desktop study because, let's face it, at that time, uh, last spring, everybody was um, uh, working from home and uh, many jurisdictions were under some uh, kind of uh, or type of lockdown. But we calculated and obtained data uh, from uh, cities across Italy uh, and elsewhere in Europe and then extrapolated that in terms of mask use and glove use um, for the entire global population, 7.7 odd billion people. And we calculated, bear in mind this is an estimate, 129 billion face masks and 65 billion gloves were used um, monthly uh, across the globe. And uh, whilst those numbers were estimates, uh, many since have uh, calculated and done their own estimates using different back of the envelope calculations. And always the numbers are staggeringly high and very close to that. Um, and here you can see images you're more than familiar with um, on this call, indiscriminate uh, use of uh, or disposal of masks and gloves in the environment. And we believe, and, and you know, some empirical data and findings have borne out uh, these theories, but we believe that at the time, we were advised on how to protect ourselves from the virus. And remember, it's a, 
um, aerosol borne uh, virus, which is uh, airborne. Uh, but at the time, very little of that knowledge was uh, uh, messaged, I guess, uh, from uh, local governments or, or regional governments to members of the public. So I think out of sheer panic, a lot of people didn't really understand how the virus was transmitted. So there was lots of use of non-medical use of gloves, um, when in fact hand washing and good hand hygiene would have uh, sufficed. And also there was no real advice um, or messaging, clear messaging on how to dispose of masks or gloves when they were finished. I mean, that's since been issued by the World Health Organization and many jurisdictions, but initially early in the pa uh, pandemic, many people didn't know. And uh, so they were fearful. And I think this is why a lot of this material was found in the environment. And uh, that 129 billion masks per month was such a staggering figure. One uh, news media outlet uh, did their own back of the envelope calculation and calculated that that would be enough to cover the size, a country a size of Switzerland in just one year. So it is staggering, they're enormous numbers. And it, remember, it's important to use um, masks to um, prevent the spread of uh, COVID-19. Um, so we needed to do this, and the masks have certainly kept us uh, safe, but it's not without the environmental impacts. And so those were uh, some fun uh, desktop studies producing some staggering numbers. And um, early last year in the spring, uh, some researchers in uh, Toronto, um, uh, Justine uh, Amadolia and uh, a partner and colleagues, uh, started to walk a consistent route in downtown Toronto uh, for several months. And they were using a marine debris tracker, uh, uh, an app that uh, is available um, on mobile devices. And uh, it was allowed them to characterize and enumerate um, plastic debris in general, but uh, specifically in this study, they targeted PPE. And uh, the rough distribution from their uh, two month repeated um, uh, monitoring walk um, over different uh, land use areas um, produced 25% of the debris were wipes, 31% were face masks and 44% were disposable gloves. And you can see from this infographic, the highest density was found in parking lots. And again, this is in broad agreement with our own observations and many of your own observations, um, particularly near grocery stores. So people get the groceries, they take off their gloves, and I don't know why they were disposed of and, and released into the environment and not taken home. I'll talk about the correct uh, disposal of this material later towards the end of the call, but they found uh, that uh, the highest densities were near hospital districts and parking lots, um, and then lower densities in uh, uh, you know, more recreational trail uh, type areas. And there've been many other studies since then uh, that have uh, taken empirical data and documented the impacts of uh, PPE. And so we knew they were in the environment. Uh, researchers had started to count them, and uh, it, it wasn't long before reports came in that uh, impacts to wildlife was now being documented and reported in, in the academic uh, literature. And so the first victim that was reported um, uh, was uh, an American robin here in Canada, in uh, British Columbia. And uh, this study uh, was the, the first I was aware of that started to list and document uh, entanglement, ingestion, and mortality impacts of wildlife um, internationally. And so this, um, here we go, we've got another example here. This is a, a Magellanic, juvenile Magellanic penguin, uh, which was found dead uh, off the coast of Brazil, and that had uh, ingested a face mask. So it, it didn't reach maturity, um, and, and this is an unfortunate victim of, of COVID. Um, that was documented, but what about all those that uh, organisms and wildlife that go uh, undocumented or unobserved? And so the, this study started to document this, and it still is a, a living document whereby reports of uh, a species, the type of entanglement and the location of where it was entangled or, or found dead um, can be uploaded to this uh, living website. But this was the paper that came out of it published in Animal Biology. 
And so there's a long laundry list of hundreds, thousands of species that have been documented, um, impacted by um, uh, PPE, again, as a, as a result of the, uh, the pandemic. And again, this is not just unique to uh, PPE. Uh, wildlife has been impacted by single-use plastics for decades now, and we know this. This is just an example um, which has, has been made popular by the fact that we're still living in the pandemic. And you can see here the American robin listed as the first victim and uh, uh, coming in at number 22, the poor juvenile Magellanic penguin. And so now we know um, we counted them in the environment. We extrapolated and did a back of the envelope calculation in the environment. We know they're impacting wildlife. And here we go, a single use plastic uh, uh, mass, face mass. They've, they're comprised of uh, wind or, or kind of um, air blown or melt blown cloth. And it's a plastic polymer. Whilst it might have the look and feel of cotton, it's not. Um, and uh, this study was recently reported and, and talked about the staggering numbers of microplastics that degrade and break down uh, from those mass when they reach the environment. And again, this is not a problem which is unique to PPE. This is occurring with all plastics in the uh, natural environment. Um, but I think it's, um, it's important to recognize this and the impacts of, of uh, PPE once it's in the environment. So this study documented, like many of us have already done before in, in, uh, in academia, in the scholarly literature, uh, that masks are widely observed uh, along shorelines during the pandemic. And we know this from um, organizations like the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Prior to 2020, PPE was not even a category uh, which made the top 12 single-use plastics um, that were regularly found on beaches. And in 2020 and again in 21, uh, PPE, masks and gloves were uh, key players in terms of the top uh, 12 uh, or the dirty dozen of single-use plastics found on shoreline cleanups. And um, this study documented that those masks were releasing up to 1.5 million microplastics um, in the, uh, through weathering and UV degradation, and even up to 15 million, uh, or was it 16 million microplastics released when these masks were being, um, uh, the, the natural abrasion when on the shoreline and when mixing with sand. So it's one mask, millions of uh, microplastics released. And so if we go back to um, what, uh, what strategies and actions were occurring prior to the pandemic, this is what it looked like um, globally for uh, policies where single-use plastics were eliminated, taxed, or levied in some jurisdictions. And then COVID hit. And so this is really early on, uh, by the way, this is a study um, which was published in Science of the Total Environment uh, in the middle of last year. And this is documenting all the, those jurisdictions that reversed their single-use plastic uh, reduction policies. And just to give you some context on that, um, in uh, Nova Scotia last year, uh, single-use plastic bags were eliminated um, uh, by the provincial government. And we were poised to eliminate those on uh, October the 31st, 2020. We actually stuck to that deadline um, in Newfoundland that they were meant to eliminate them in July, but they postponed for a couple of months until uh, uh, October as well. But in many jurisdictions around the world, <clears throat> they actually reversed uh, their plastic reduction policies and especially in the States. And uh, also some corporations uh, like supermarket chains whilst they'd taken on the, uh, their own initiative to reduce single-use plastic uh, items, uh, they reversed their policies as well. Again, this is born out of fear um, in terms of contact and uh, preventing transmission of the virus. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, in, in a short while. Again, this is early on last spring uh, in 2020. This is uh, countries or jurisdictions where masks, uh, mass mandates uh, were implemented. And now, now we're well into this uh, pandemic, almost in the, you know, towards the end of the second year, most of the, the planet will have a mask mandate now, so it would look red. So that's just to give you some context. 
And um, this is a study we did, uh, a national survey across Canada to look for consumer preferences and perceptions on um, single use plastics and uh, single use plastics use during COVID. And we asked the question, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, I have been more concerned um, about the safety of my food. And the vast majority were concerned or strongly agreed with the, this, this line of questioning. And we didn't see this same concern the previous year. In fact, in a similar study, to look for people's uh, perceptions um, about the use of single-use plastics. Many people were very supportive to reduce their use of single-use plastics. So we know that people were fearful uh, about the virus and the transmission. And we know we're still living this right now. Um, many people are, are still yet to be vaccinated. Canada um, is doing quite well in terms of second doses, but still, as the vaccines are rolled out around the world, this is the, the, the kinds of plastic waste that's being generated as a result of the pandemic. And yes, medical waste has, has always been with us. And yes, the flu uh, vaccination each year generates similar quantities, but this is a double vaccine for every single living person on the planet in theory. Um, and so it's a mountain, uh, a sudden increase in plastics. And here we are. We know that the, uh, the key to keeping it out of uh, society and community spread is to test and test and test again, but it still uh, generates single-use plastics. So this is kit, uh, kits I picked up last week from, from work. I know my children now bring home uh, testing kits from school. And uh, once the test has been implemented, whoops, go back, um, it, uh, oh, it won't do the animation. Yes, it does. And, uh, but in many jurisdictions, this is a, an image from Europe, we can see that some of these kits are now being distributed in cardboard boxes. So whilst it doesn't eliminate the plastic inside, uh, like the swab, at least the packaging uh, could be made of cardboard and paper, which is uh, recycled. And here we are, we're well into a year and a half, nearly two years in the pandemic, but why are we still polluting this title of this article is uh, editorial is marine environment, but any environment. And we're still indiscriminately disposing uh, of uh, PPE and other single use plastics. And there is a solution or well, there are several solutions. And this is going back to the earlier point. So the World Health Organization recommends that PPE can be disposed of in the closed lid receptacles um, and not open garbage bins where they might be blown away into the environment. Um, and used PPE should be treated as potentially infectious. Um, here in Canada, um, many uh, municipalities have uh, suggested and recommended um, that PPE um, can be disposed of in your regular garbage. Um, and again, if you wanted to be uh, cautious as well, leave it for three days. That's approximately the time that the viable virus can live on the surface of plastics and then seal it up and uh, put it on the curbside with your regular garbage. And that in theory it, uh, would keep us uh, all safe. And then there are some jurisdictions that use waste to energy, not with just um, uh, PPE and con potentially contaminated waste, but also single use plastics. And whilst that's not ideal because it still produces greenhouse gases, it's still preferable to being um, uh, indiscriminately released into the environment. Um, but unfortunately, there are jurisdictions that uh, are not as fortunate uh, where waste mismanagement is still a big issue. And of course, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic really exacerbated their waste management infrastructure. And so some of these could be uh, 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 burnt in open pits, um, uh, releasing dioxins and furans and other contaminants into the atmosphere or in uh, poorly managed um, shallow landfills which are inadequate. And um, there was a, um, a statement uh, released last year by a series of health experts that really suggested that there's no advantage to using single-use plastics for your food and takeout or retail um, items and even uh, PPE masks. So for example, their rationale and, uh, and, and, and thought behind this was the virus can live on, single, on, on plastic surfaces for about three days. We know this, 
And so um, there's no difference between the virus living on the surface of a single use plastic item and uh, the virus living on a reusable plastic or other material item. And so the best solution is to make sure that these are kept clean uh, and rewashed and reused. And if we avoid the single use uh, plastic item, whether it's PPE or whether it's for uh, utensils and, and carry out items, then we can also uh, curb the mass production of COVID related uh, pandemic waste. Um, so disposable products present similar issues as reusable ones. So there's no advantage really. Um, reusable products are easily cleaned and uh, best practices for re reusable products in retail space, um, there are many. And you can refer to the um, health experts, which comprised of uh, medical staff, medical experts and epidemiologists. And here in Canada, we had a, a similar uh, finding and report released by the National Zero Waste Council of Canada. They conducted their own study uh, to look for, um, uh, you know, items that are often used in food and retail outlets. And as I mentioned before, once the pandemic hit, there was widespread use of single use plastic items in those settings. And uh, the public health guidance and scientific evidence suggests there may there are many opportunities to use reusables in retail during the pandemic. And their rationale, again, very similar to the previous uh, statement from the health experts the year before, was the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus can live for several days on various surfaces, including plastics. And it makes no difference whether it's single use or whether it's a reusable uh, item. So make sure it, it's kept clean. Um, so we don't always have to rely on the single use uh, plastic options. And uh, for my own part, whoops, it's, uh, I've gone to the end of the slideshow. Um, and for my own part, I do my bit uh, by continuing to, uh, uh, to use my cotton mask. Um, and so that's it from me. And um, I'm open to questions if we still have time, uh, Natalie. Thank you very much, Tony, for that very interesting presentation. Um, it's now time to open the virtual floor to the audience. Uh, I'll first check the chat. I think I saw some questions coming in during your presentation, Tony. Um, and if anyone else has additional questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can um, raise your virtual hand and I'll call on you. So, um, Tony, the, the first question is, um, what about bioplastics with a high percent of plastic breaking down to release microplastics if not properly managed, and in some cases, even if industrially composted. So did you wanna comment on, on bioplastics? Yeah, that is an absolute minefield. Um, so whether uh, they, there's a lot of confusion uh, in consumer products, uh, and it wasn't just related to COVID, that was with us uh, uh, for many years before. And in fact, that's the dread of many uh, uh, waste managers in municipalities nowadays, because there's widespread uh, sale and use of um, either biodegradable plastics, which gives the impression that, hey, I can use this, and it will break down in the environment. Wonderful, you might think. And then there's the um, bio-based uh, uh, plastics. And so there are um, just some caveats with that. Depending on where you source this material uh, from and what uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, you might live in, many of these products only break down in certain industrial facilities. And even then, they still comprise of plastic, i.e. fossil fuel-based uh, polymers, so whilst a portion of them may genuinely be um, uh, organic and uh, natural uh, or plant-based or, uh, you know, I don't know, fiber-based, uh, there is a proportion of that uh, material that can still break down into conventional microplastics, which is an impact on the environment. And again, if they're not uh, uh, deposited or composted in these industrial facilities, which don't exist everywhere, in fact, they're actually quite limited, um, all you're doing is contaminating a waste stream that otherwise could be conventionally uh, converted into compost and used uh, in municipalities. So, yeah, it's a big issue. Um, the best advice would be to completely avoid it and uh, go with something which, you know, is genuinely uh, reusable or avoid the convenience item altogether. Uh, 
Um, you're on mute, Natalie. Thank you, Tony. Um, the second question in the chat, I don't know, it's a comment and a question, seems cotton masks could maybe replace disposable. I think lots of people reuse disposable masks anyway. Um, so I, I, you did touch on, on that, I believe, in, in, your, in your seminar. Um, yeah, so I, I think if I'm uh, hearing this correctly, um, I, I think the, uh, the participant asked the question, yes, they recognize that cotton uh, are reusable and they already do, but they also suggested that disposable masks can be reused again. Well, yeah, that's true. I, I know uh, uh, several uh, people in the medical field that do so, and uh, there's no um, negative impacts, but you know, they're pretty fragile. They're not that well made and they were designed for single use. So the, uh, the little um, elastic strap tends to come apart. And before you know it, you might reuse it a couple of times, but I, 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 I would guarantee that you couldn't use it indefinitely. It, it will just break on you and then it has to be disposed of. That's, that's right, that's right. Um, I, and then you did comment on this, Tony, later in, after the, comment, the, the question was placed in the chat, but uh, just for the sake of, uh, of you being aware of the question there, uh, certainly correct disposable must be reinforced, but the lightweight disposable, disposable masks also fall out of pockets and blow out of open trash receptacles, thus littering the landscape. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, uh, I'm not um, uh, insinuating that people are wantonly disposing of these. A lot of it could be accidental. It could fall out the pockets in your in your clothing, pockets in the the side doors of your car. Um, but yeah, there was a a lot of masks found very quickly, and uh, it it really does make me think that probably people panic and didn't know how to properly dispose of them as well. But we're learning and we're getting better. Uh, so um, another question in the chat, what do you propose as an approach to McGill admin who insist on two single use masks per day, one in the AM and one in the PM, and no personal reusable masks allowed for staff? Oh, crikey, I uh, wasn't aware of that. I have been asked this question before uh, as it relates to uh, provincial uh, or municipal workers uh, when I give similar talks. But again, um, based on the evidence, based on the epidemiologists and based on some there have been some uh, uh, academic studies that uh, compare and contrast uh, virus spread and virus containment with a whole range of masks including many different styles of um, uh, medical and non-medical single use and also uh, various cotton or other materials and when compared uh, whilst the statistical variance is very small, and, and for the most part, uh, the, there's no statistical difference between the commonly used single-use disposable mask and uh, uh, a, a well-maintained and cleaned cotton mask. So you could go to work with two cotton masks. That's, that would be my advice. And uh, it would still reduce the spread of uh, COVID-19 and keep everyone safe. Thank you, Tony. Related to that question, there's actually another very closely related question. How can we convince schools to allow the cotton masks again instead of giving every day um, new surgical masks? At least that's the case here in Quebec. I don't know um, yeah. how it is um, where you are. Well, if you're referring to uh, schools like the uh, um, uh, a university behind me or where my two eight-year-olds uh, attend, uh, here in Nova Scotia, uh, we are allowed to uh, use any, as long as it's a mask, um, and I, I guess there's a lot of latitude and expecting that people are wearing a clean one and regularly changing them. Um, we are not forced or mandated to, uh, to use a disposable uh, mask twice daily. And I know in some jurisdictions you can't avoid it. But I, again, I will only stress that there is, there is scientific and epidemiology evidence out there to suggest that you don't need to, but can still maintain public safety. So it's a kind of a win win. Thanks, Tony. I'm just going to check if there are any further questions. I don't see any hands up. Um, I, I don't see any more questions. Maybe there's just one more that came in. Um, ah, here's a question. Um, I agree that personal action can make a difference, but given the volume of PPE disposed, I expected the local governments, such as the City of Montreal, to organize PPE disposal. It has not happened. Why the lack of action from those in charge? Um, yeah, I'm sure that I agree. Um, individual action combined uh, with uh, local government, uh, municipal, 
and uh, well, I guess that is local, but yeah, municipal and provincial and federal government uh, helps here in Canada. It varies across jurisdictions. Even just having this conversation today, I realized that McGill is different to Dal and your schools in Quebec are different to schools in Nova Scotia. I think that's, I think that's to be expected. There are all kinds of different decisions made for uh, sometimes uh, the right reasons and sometimes misinformed reasons. Um, but yeah, going back to your waste disposal and maybe um, uh, either mandating uh, proper cleanup or recycling, that is quite widespread in, in parts of Europe and, and especially Denmark, if I was to use Denmark as an example, there are um, uh, waste receptacles in society specifically designed and are popped up to receive uh, PPE waste. And they're dealt with either uh, incinerated. A lot of Scandinavian countries do waste to energy. And that's the route that many of these uh, items would uh, be destined. Thank you, Tony. Well, th that concludes our time today. Um, I'd like to thank you, Tony, for taking the time to share your important work with us. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we all learned something uh, very new to here today and very important. Uh, I want to thank Brace and Ty said for hosting the seminar and thank you to everyone who joined us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie. Bye, everyone.